name is Sally Caselli. The following is a comprehensive tutorial on using Microsoft Excel 2019, which is based on Office 365. We will start with the very basics, and then we will go into intermediate and advanced features of Excel. This tutorial is designed for business professionals who are looking to advance in their career by sharpening their Microsoft Office skills and is great for students to learn Excel. Please also note that if you would like to follow along, the accompanying working files are located in the video description. I have designed this tutorial to be concepts-based, which means that most of the features covered here apply to previous versions and even later versions of newer versions of Excel. So let's get started. This assumes that we are using the installed or the desktop version of Microsoft Excel in your computer. So we're going to go here under Start, and then we are going to look for Microsoft Excel. So we'll just type here Excel, and then hit Enter. Let's just uh, get acquainted a little bit with the application interface so that we know what is where. As soon as we open the application, on the very top, we have the option to create a blank workbook or an Excel spreadsheet. We have some quick guides here from Microsoft. And then further down here, we have a bunch of templates that Microsoft has included in this version of Excel. There are various categories that you can pick on the left-hand side under the Home tab. This includes any of the recent spreadsheets that you have been working on. Here under uh, Pinned, this will show the files that you have pinned that you want always to show up in this list. And then under Shared with me, in this case, you'd need to be signed in to Office Online. And this is where the documents that have been shared with you are going to be available. On the left-hand side here, we have the option to create new documents. So the new documents would be whether it's a blank worksheet or use one of those templates from here. Keep in mind that you can search for new templates on the very top and also use the categories over here. Under Open, this is the option where you can choose to open an existing file in your computer. Now, notice that you have a whole bunch of other options here, but the easiest, the best would be to just simply choose this PC and then navigate under this PC, the various files and directories, wherever you have your files. Further down here, you also have the account that has been associated with Microsoft, basically your Microsoft 365 account. Then under Options, this is where you can customize the various options related to this application, whether it's the general options or formulas or data and uh, how to save and how often to save your documents and things of that nature. And now it's important to understand as well that those options are going to be under file here on the home tab as well. And then if you scroll down, uh, you will see them in the very bottom of the screen. Now let's go back home here. And let's suppose that we wanted to create a new document and also at the same time keep on looking again at the interface of this application to get an understanding as to how this application works. So if we click here on the blank document, which I just did, notice that in the very top here you have these tabs. So you have the Home tab with all of these sets of icons here. And uh, those are kind of called groupings of icons. So Microsoft has tried to group things of or functions or similar functions together. For example, for the alignment of the content, it would be under the alignment grouping on the Home tab. Then you have the Insert tab here, and that has new sets of uh, groupings and icons and functions here as well. Then under Draw, you have additional options, and then Page Layout, another tab, and Formulas. And this is where the beauty of Excel is, or the major functionality of Excel is under the Formulas area. Then you have the Data tab, View, uh, View, and Help as well. Keep in mind uh, that uh, on the top right here, you also have the Tell Me feature in Microsoft Excel, where you can simply, without you, if you don't know how to or where a particular function is, for example, a footer, you can simply type it in here and then click on that option and it will take you directly to that particular function. So you technically don't really need to know where something is 
as long as you know what you're looking for. Then further down here, you have these uh, sheet one. So notice each um, Excel file starts with one sheet and you can add as many sheets as you want to it by using this button here on the bottom right. Notice now we have sheet two, sheet three and such. Think of those just as uh, pages on a notebook. On the bottom right hand side, you have some options here for the layout. So this is the normal layout of this document or of this uh, spreadsheet in this case. You also have the page layout. If you prefer to look at that, that's how the document or the spreadsheet would print out. You also have the page break. So this is if we are using page breaks in this document. Notice you can zoom in and out here by pressing this plus and minus sign here in the very bottom. Now, a couple of things um, before we get into the actual, uh, to using the application and some of the functions in the application here. So you'll notice that you have all of these blocks here or cells, and then you have these numbers here on the left. And obviously, I'm going on with the very basics of using Excel. So we're just starting as basic as it can be in this case. So you have these rows here, and you have these columns. And then you also have these, these little blocks. So those are referred to as the cells. Those horizontally, those would be your rows. And then these would be your columns. And then each one of those blocks has a reference to it or an address for it. So for example, if we were to type something in here, let 10 in there, let's add a value of 10. This cell, we would reference it by using the column and the row number. So it would be B3. The reference for this or the address for this would be B3. Now, the nice thing in Excel is, is that when you do calculations, and that's the whole point of using Excel, you usually use those references or those addresses. So we don't say here, for example, if we wanted to get the total here, and we'll get into these in a little bit in more details as to what I'm doing here next as far as the sum and such. But let's say if we wanted to add those two numbers, yes, you could say 10 plus 5, and then the computer will give you the total, but you typically use in there sum of B3, colon b4 and for now just focus on the reference for it so now notice the total is 15 once i hit enter the nice thing about using references is, is that if i change one of those values let's say to 10 here now notice the total will be updated automatically so the key here to remember is that in Excel, you have those rows and the columns and these cells. Each cell has a reference to it, and it's best to use the reference for that specific cell, which then contains the value. Now, the spreadsheets are, of course, used for calculations, for budgets, uh, anything financial related. The spreadsheets are very powerful and can be very useful in a business environment, whether you're a professional, that you want to advance in your career and get the right skills for the job and such, or the jobs and the employment opportunities, but also as a student. Now, those sheets, we started with one sheet here, but as I mentioned earlier, you can add as many sheets as you want by simply tapping on the Add icon here. Now those sheets also can be renamed. So if you right click on this and choose rename, you can call this week one or month one or whatever you want to reference it or the year. It's also uh, important to understand that you can perform calculations between sheets and we'll learn about this. And then finally, as far as the interface here and some of the generic components or general components of Excel, Notice that you also have this formula bar here, or this area where you enter the formulas. And uh, the formulas, uh, we'll learn about them in a little bit, are basically what perform the calculations in Excel. So stay tuned for the next session here, where we are going to learn about doing some of the basic functions and calculations using an Excel, now that you have some of the foundations on a spreadsheet and also you have the foundations on the layout and the components of Excel. 
And as we finish here, just uh, for terminology, you'll hear the term spreadsheet and worksheet. Typically, those will be the worksheets here. So you have each sheet here. The spreadsheet is the whole file here with all of these worksheets. Like I said, stay tuned for the next session where we'll get to study and learn about basic functions related to Microsoft Excel. In this session, I'm going to go over some of the basic functions in Microsoft Excel 2019, which is part of Office 365. Remember, those functions are not tied only to Excel 2019. They are useful also for previous versions or, and also later versions of Excel. If you'd like to follow along, you might need to download this accompanying file that has a whole bunch of those tabs here and basically all the various components that we'll go through in this tutorial. So now that we opened Excel, we understand the various interface components of Microsoft Excel 2019. Now we'll go under the basic concepts tab here in the bottom and perform some specific and basic uh, functions. Let's say we wanted to calculate the office expenses. We have all of these cells. In each one of those cells, you can type texts numbers and values and such it can be a general number it can be a specific number currency accounting type of format numbers dates percentages you can format these cells or the values in the cells in percentages fractions and scientific notations and text so here we basically want to calculate the expenses for our office Supposedly we have office supplies, computer expenses, photocopying, printing, travel expenses, service contacts. Now for each month we have recorded the amounts and then we want to get the total for the training for each category. Also we want to get the totals for each month down here. First we want to format these currency. We simply select those specific cells, go up here under the number grouping and then click on the drop down and we choose currency currency is going to put that dollar sign in front of it and the other two decimal points you can do it from here or you can click on this dollar amount in here if you're using various other currencies you can pick those in here now let's say that we wanted to get the totals for trainings all of those calculations are performed by using formulas to perform any calculations in excel start with an equal sign followed by some kind of function now the function itself can be any of those in here so if we click on the formulas click on function the functions can be financial functions any of those that you see right here logical functions lookup and reference math and trigonometry so if we wanted to look at the whole list of them here under all Notice that there are hundreds of functions that you can utilize in Excel. Now, for the purpose of this tutorial, we are just going to learn about some of those functions so that you get the concepts. And then once you know how this stuff works, then you can go and explore this even furthermore on your own. So, for example, here, I, I clicked here under formulas and I chose insert function in case you wanted to find what sum does typing in there click the go here notice it says it adds numbers in a range of cells so if we go back here to get the sum of those numbers like i mentioned earlier you need to start with the equal sign the word sum and then you can open parentheses and then here you can reference the actual starting point which would be b6 notice you have uh, column b and then the row is number six so you type in there b6 this is the manual way that we are learning to do this at this point and then colon this means anything from that starting point to let's say d to where it says here for march training which would be d6 and then close parentheses and hit enter so that's one way to do this 
So notice now the calculation is 700. If January's training expenses were 250, notice the total will change automatically. And that's the beauty of Excel. That's why you use formulas and calculations and you use this tool. So that's one way to enter the formula in here. Let's do this another uh, manual way here. So here we say sum and you can press tab and it will put the capital letters and also the parenthesis thing. Then you can either tap in here the starting point. So notice it's 300 and it puts B7 automatically. So you don't have to gauge it where it uh, goes horizontally and vertically where they meet. And also you can put their colon and then the end point or you can simply select the cells that you want to add up and notice it will put the colon in there automatically and then all you have to do is you hit enter. So again, before I hit enter, to summarize it, you press the equal sign telling the computer that you're going to calculate something in there to start a formula. Then you put the function, which is in this case, it's the sum, adding those numbers. And then we simply selected what the range that we want it to select then hit enter and notice the amount here has been calculated. In most cases in business, most individuals also use this function here, the automatic calculation. So let's suppose that I didn't have either one of those and I want a calculation in here. Notice that under the home tab and then under auto sum, it automatically will add up a bunch of uh, cells and the values in them you click on it and the computer is going to select those items automatically. You hit enter here and it gives you the calculation. Now what about if I wanted to do the calculation over here? Notice it's going to try to do the selection as well. Now you, of course you could adjust that selection before hitting enter and that's another way of doing it. Now I showed you the manual way before because that's going to be more accurate and it also gives and reinforces the concept as to how this works. So now if we wanted to get the totals for January here, we could do it either way. We could either use the automatic calculation here on the top right on the home tab, or we could do it the manual way and select the range and then hit enter. Next here, how can we populate the same formulas here that we entered in this cell for these other ones without having to do it manually for each one of them? Instead of us spending time to enter the formulas here in each cell, we can simply replicate what's entered in this cell, which by the way, here is what's entered in that cell behind the scenes. This is the formula bar here on the top. Now to replicate it, notice there is a little dot here on the bottom right. All you have to do is you hold the mouse on that dot on the bottom right and then drag far down you want to go. And notice the computer is going to calculate everything for the subsequent rows. Whenever you do this, try to double check the work. And the way you do that is that you click on any of these calculations then you come here under the formula bar and then see what's being calculated. So it's getting us a sum of B12 all the way through D12, which is B12, that's the 13 here, and then all the way to D12. So spot check that work before you submit something that you'll later regret that it was not calculated correctly. If we wanted to do the calculation here as well uh, for the totals for, for each month, you can do it the same way. So you can go to the bottom under this dot and then drag the mouse to the right. This works vertically top down and horizontally from left going to the right. Notice we got a bunch of these number signs in here, and this is a very common thing that, that means that the column is not wide enough. And all you have to do is either drag this to the right a little bit manually like that, or by double clicking between the columns here, C and D, and the computer is going to adjust it exactly to the widest value in any of the cells. And we do that for the next one as well. The autofill feature works for anything sequential. It can also work for days of the week or a specific uh, sequence of numbers that you have. So for example, if we have here Monday and then we want to replicate the other days of the week, you can simply drag this down and you have all the other days of the week. If you wanted to do it for months of the year, just type the name of the month 
drag it down and it will replicate the months and keep on going. It can also work for sequences of numbers. Now you can drag this down by selecting those two values and notice it'll do 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. Let's say we wanted to learn about formatting and making this look slightly nicer. You can select any of those cells and then notice you have these styles. It's very similar to the styles and formatting styles in Microsoft Word. We can either click on the drop down and pick any of those designs and notice uh, it's giving us what's called a live preview. So you can do this for all the cells in here. The other thing that you can do is you can simply select here the whole table and you can choose format as a table and then you can pick one of those designs and click OK here and now notice applied that specific design in there instead of us doing it manually and I just undid it for now. The other thing to keep in mind is conditional formatting. Conditional formatting is a tool that you can utilize to easily spot trends and patterns in your data using bars, colors, icons to visually highlight important ones. So in this case, we just want to pinpoint which ones were the highest expenses in our data set here. So we go here under conditional formatting and you have all of these different rules. So you can choose to show anything greater than a specific value, anything less than, anything that equals, or duplicate values to highlight them and things of that nature. Also the top 10 and the bottom 10%. So if you had, if you wanted to identify the top 10 items, top 10 sales and such, all you have to do is you just pick any of those. You can do data bar. So basically it'll give you a little chart similar to that or you can do color code it and you can create your own rule as well and your own criteria. So for now, I'm just simply going to use the color coding and uh, this basically puts a little chart within each cell to give us the uh, definition of uh, the items with a higher value in them. So if we change this to 5,000, notice everything else will be readjusted. Now we can do it for the total conditional formatting and let's say we want color coded for a range of cells. In this video, we're going to learn how to use some additional basic functions in Excel. We want to find the highest value of a data set. Let's say we have these expenses for January, and we want to post the highest value of all the numbers in that column. So to do that, you can either go here under the Home tab, under Auto Sum in the drop down, you choose Max, and notice it's going to select a bunch of the cells. Now, in this case, we don't really want the total here. So all we have to do is we select the values that we want to be included in that selection and simply hit enter. That's one way of doing it. I'm going to delete it. The other way to do this is by simply start with the equal sign and then we want to find the max and then press tab and then just simply select the references, the numbers that you want to include in your calculation, and then hit enter. Notice the highest number is 5,000. If we change this to 12,000, we're going to readjust the column. Notice that it's posting here that that's the highest number. Now you can repeat this in the other columns here as well for the other months, or you can use, as we learned in the previous module, you can replicate this formula that is in this cell by using the autofill feature. So we hold down the mouse on the bottom right, drag it to the right here, and it will give us the actual values. Now you'd say, well, how do I calculate the minimum, the lowest number among all of those numbers? You can either go under the Home tab here and then choose this common functions minimum, or you can simply type in here equal sign, M-I-N, so 
formula start always with the equal sign then there is the function in this case is the minimum tab and then put in the range so there are three components to each formula hit enter notice the lowest number here is 13. if we wanted to find the same thing for the other months simply drag this to the right and you'll have this posted with the numbers now let's say this was one dollar notice that has been updated here in the bottom again try to get the concept of how this works even if uh, you're trying to figure out some more advanced function you can look it up you can use a tell me feature up here for that particular function you can search the web and such but the concept is going to be very much the same you're going to look through a set of data within the ranges of the data performing a specific function relating that data so in this case we want to get the average we don't know what the average function is in excel we can simply start by typing equal start typing whatever it is that you're trying to do in this case we want the average notice it gives us an explanation as well next to it double click or simply press tab and select the range of data hit enter and this is the average for all these values now if i wanted to count how many items do i have in here so if you look here on the top right under the home tab you have count numbers go right here click on insert and then count numbers notice it does count and then select your data notice there are nine if we go to the right notice in this case there are only eight and the reason for that is because there's no value in c14 this should give you a very basic overview of using excel just the basic functions that's how what functions you typically use to calculate taxes or calculate budgets and things of that nature you might use multiplication and division which we'll cover it in just a moment here you could use this in business for example to calculate the expenses for various uh, sales of cars and such so in this case we simply do the equal sign there sum the range and then replicate it for all the other ones and such and then find the average as well in a similar way In this session, we are going to perform additional functions using Excel. This will come in handy in uh, financial or budget calculations. So let's say we have here the monthly pay for each individual or employee, and then we have the various deductions. Now we want to find the total deductions for that particular employee, their net pay, what's left over after paying for the deductions, the annual net pay. So we want to learn how to multiply it and what their net pay would be annually and then weekly pay so to get the totals we're going to use a concept that we already learned from the previous sessions we're simply going to get the sum of those two values deduction one and deduction two so we do that by using equal sign sum press tab to auto fill that part of it there and then those two references so c6 all the way through d6 then hit enter now we can replicate that by using the autofill feature that we learned earlier next we want to calculate the net pay so the net pay would be the gross pay minus the deductions that would give us the net pay so in this case you're learning how to subtract two values so in this case we can do that without using a function and we can simply put the initial amount so this would be b6 minus the total deductions e6 and then simply hit enter now those numbers mean that uh, the values didn't fit in that cell and we simply need to resize the column here so it, it was like that we can double click here between the columns which i covered also in the previous section so the net pay for this individual which was basically taking their gross pay minus deductions and then we got the net pay 
we can use the auto fill and we have the totals in here you could do it by having that 12 month value as part of the formula so to do it as part of the formula you simply enter the equal sign then you take the net pay just click on it f6 times which is the asterisk and then 12 hit enter that would be the annual pay so that's one way to do it the other way to do it would be to use a reference point so we have the equal sign the net pay here f7 times and our reference point will be 12 in this case this 12 on the top hit enter the advantage of this method is is that okay let's see how much this employee would be paid in two years so you simply change that value to 24 you hit enter and notice that will be their two-year salary or let's say for six months you simply enter and change the value so that would be a good use if you're doing projections if we use the auto fill here with a reference point there will be an issue and i'm not going to go into that at this point because i'll cover it in the data types in just a little bit uh, but that has to do with using absolute references so for now we're just going to use it embedded into the formula now supposedly we wanted to get the weekly pay there are 52 weeks in a year we know that the net pay per month is $3,400 per year it's $41,000 but now per week there are 52 weeks in a year equal sign here the annual net pay divided which is a slash by 52 and there is your weekly pay or this individual's weekly pay so so far we learned about uh, using uh, the sum to add the deductions we use the subtraction to take off the deductions from the pay and then we also focus on multiplication and also division and then earlier we learned about a few additional functions that are still on the basic nature of using excel session we're going to learn about using the quick analysis tool let's suppose we have a bunch of data very similar to this and we want to find out and utilize some quick analysis tool all you have to do is select the data click here on the very bottom right under quick analysis this will show you live previews with the data so for some conditional formatting it's going to format the data within the cells and using bars so notice it uses to highlight interesting data you can do it color coded or icons whether the values went up or down and such or greater than a certain amount or specific text you can create charts based on this data cluster chart so it would look like this also you have the tab here for the totals basically the system is going to add another row it's going to give you the sum or the average or the count of them or the percent total or the running total here and sums as well notice it added another column on the right hand side you can also create additional tables for example you if you want to create a quick pivot table from here and then spark lines these are some types of charts to display the data so supposedly we wanted the data charts there it is we just simply select it and then apply the values if we wanted to create a specific chart click on it and notice we have the values right here let's say that we are going to create a pivot table notice it will create a new worksheet here in the bottom you can unselect certain items from our table and it will keep on giving us the various values or here on the right hand side you can customize whether you want to show specific sales whether you want to display the company 
and whether you want to apply filters and then you want to sort it by various values or industries and such. So if we go here under filters, now under the industry, we can choose to display only those specific companies within that selection. You can customize this even further by adding more than one criteria. So this has to do more with pivot tables and working with pivot tables and such. But the idea is, is that uh, you can go here to quick analysis and create whether it's charts and such or trends within your data by having the computer analyze it quickly for you. It's a very similar idea with the charts. In the charts, it'll create again a new worksheet and it'll work in conjunction with the pivot tables. Notice with the chart, as we change the criteria, it will update the chart automatically. So let's say we don't want medical listed, then it will update the chart in an automated way. So that is uh, quick tools. The idea here is to select the data, go under the quick analysis tools and explore these features. In this session, we're going to learn about the types of references in Microsoft Excel. If you go back to the previous sessions on learning Excel, we have been using what's called the relative references. If we were to look back here under the basic concepts, when we calculated these values and I entered the amounts, notice that the reference here is B6 through D6, but then when I used the autofill feature to get those formulas populated, notice that it went to B7 to D7, and then the next one it went to B8 through D8 and such. So anything sequential, it did it automatically. And those are what's referred to as relative references. Now in Excel, there are also absolute references and mixed references. Let's reference in here B8. So we do equal sign B8, enter, and that just says $4,000. It's posting in here whatever is on B8. Now that currently is a relative reference. If I go down, notice it replicates what's here on the left hand side. It went from B8, so it started with B9 and such. If I were to change this to an absolute reference, which is by pressing the F4 key on the keyboard, notice it puts these dollar signs. It's locking it to this specific cell, to both the B column, and it's locking it also on the eighth row. Now, if I have that as an absolute reference and drag this down, notice it will always give me what's on B8. Basically, it'll keep staying at 4,000. And that's because we are using absolute references. There are also what's called mixed references. So mixed references are those that have only one dollar sign. So we are locking it either by the column or we are locking it by the row. Let's say we want the dollar sign to be locked on column B. Either take away this dollar sign in front of eight, of the row eight, either by erasing it on the keyboard or by pressing the F4 key until the right mode is selected here. So we have B8 there. Hit enter. Now notice the values are going to change. That's because we are not going to column C at this point. We are just going down. So we basically, it's still on column B. By the way, here's how you insert a new column. Right click, choose insert. So now let's say that I wanted to go from left to right. Notice I have it locked on column B. If I go left to right, remember it's going to keep on posting the 4000 value. That's because we have it locked on column B. If we did not have it locked on column B, it will give us a blank cell here because there's nothing on C or D. So anytime you want to lock a reference by a specific row or column, that's when you use a mixed reference. 
Anytime that you want to lock it by a specific reference point, that's when you use the absolute type of reference. Let's do an actual example here. So let's say we had a $20,000 budget for this year for our department. There is going to be a decrease by 5%. We have all of these categories and we want to first find out what the difference is for the 5% decrease and then we want to determine what the new budget is. So in this case, put in here equal sign and then we'll take the 4,000, which is our current budget, and multiply it by 5%, then hit enter. And notice we have to give up $200. You could keep on doing this manually for the other cells in here, and it would be just fine. It would work just fine. So if we go here and then B9 times the percentage, hit enter, notice it works just fine. However, let's suppose we have 2,000 rows here. That would take forever to do. So if we are dragging this down and using the autofill feature, now notice first it came up with this number signs, which means just we need to widen the column here. But notice that we had computer expenses by $8,000 to start with, but now the difference is $32 million. And if you look at the, the formula, it's basically multiplying 4,000 by 8,000. If we look over here, it started with B8 and B6, this times that. It went to the next one, 100 times 0. So it moved one for each of them down from 5% to the next row down. Then when it got to the 32 million one, it ended up multiplying 8,000 times 4,000 because the reference kept on shifting downwards. So to lock down that reference, for this B6, the decrease, the percentage item, and that can be any number, it doesn't have to be percent, it can be number of students or number of enrolled individuals in a project or whatever. You want to make B6 an absolute reference, to stay locked down to that point of reference. To do that, as I mentioned earlier, you use the F4 function key on the keyboard and that notice it puts a two dollars or you can enter those dollar signs manually by simply typing them in front of each uh, reference hit enter now notice it's still going to be a 200 dollars difference but when we drag this thing down it's going to give us the proper calculations because each one of them it's locked of course you can do additional calculations here you can say okay give me the totals okay and you can format that here on the right hand side if necessary and such of course those are things that you're going to explore on your own and, and then to find the totals I press tab there after i typed sum and then hit enter notice we have to give up a thousand dollars let's say that you're the manager and, and you say what about if we decrease the budget expenditures by six percent how much will we save so you just type six in here hit enter notice you'd be saving twelve hundred dollars the idea here is, is that by using absolute references you can use it to make projections the new budget you can calculate that very easily by simply equal sign the original amount minus the difference hit enter and those will be your new numbers In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to filter and sort data in Excel 2019. The process, by the way, is the same for other versions of Excel. We have this data and we want to sort it, let's say, either by date or we want to sort it by product or the region or the sales rep. So to do that, you go to the field that you want to start sorting by, go here under sort and then choose the option that you would prefer. It's by date here, or I can go here under uh, sort by product, alphabetically, A through Z. Notice that you can also right-click on this and choose sort. Let's say I wanted to sort by the region. Right-click on it and choose sort. And then you can sort by clicking on the specific field that you want to sort by, and then either right-click or go up here in the top right-hand side. So let's say we had this initially sorted by product. 
A through Z. And then we want to do multiple level sorting. So right click, choose sort, and then choose custom sort. Now here we have product first, so we could change that to region or whatever you want. And then the cell values, we want to do them A through Z or whatever that you want. That's one level, so we're starting with the product. Now let's say we want to add another level. We want the regions to be sorted next. So we go here, then sort it by the region, and then sort it in ascending order. A through Z, click OK. Now notice that we have all the eastern region the products, and then we have the Midwest region. Then it moves to the next product, quad. We have the eastern, and then we have west and such. If you go here under sort, custom sort, you can add the third column, for example, the sales rep. Add a level, choose sales rep next, and then you let's say you want A through Z. Click OK. So you have the product for that specific product, then it's by region. And then the next one is by sales rep alphabetically. And you can do uh, sales and any type of customization that you want for the sorting. Next, let's learn about filtering data. Filtering is going to display only what we have chosen to see. To do that, we can go here under the Home tab and then choose Sort and Filter and then click on the filtering option. And now notice we have these drop downs next to each label or the top of the column where our data is. We could have enabled this as well by right clicking and choosing filter. Let's say we want to filter for a specific product. Unselect all of them and we want to see only the Sunshine product. Click OK. It's going to display only that particular product. You can also do multiple level filtering by going under the region and then choosing a specific region. And let's say we want to choose only the East and Midwest. Click OK and notice only those records are going to be displayed. Obviously, you can add additional criteria by a specific amount and such. And you could use under the number filters, you could say, give me only those items above the average or give me only those below average, or you can create your own custom filter. So let's say those above the average and notice it's going to list all of those criteria for us. So we started here with a whole bunch of data and we are narrowing it down to what we prefer. Now, if we wanted to clear the filter, you can simply go to the particular item where you have the filter applied. Notice there's a little icon in here with a drop down, and then you choose to clear the filter from product. That means that all the products in this case are going to be displayed. However, the other filters are still in place and applied. Notice we don't have all the data back yet. You can go ahead and uh, clear the filter for all the other ones as well. One of the nice things is also if you right click or if you choose a drop down, whichever you want, under the number filters option, you can create a custom filter. So you can go in here and you, we are looking here at sales. You choose a drop down and notice we are choosing the option for equals, but you can uh, say does not equal or is greater than or equal to or is less than. So let's say we say greater than, let's say show us all the sales that are greater than $1,000. And then you can have another criteria if you prefer and then click OK. So that means for the sales field, we're able to apply a specific criteria. Now, of course, you can go into any of those. Let's say up for the sales rep, you can create another text filter that, uh, so the name begins with G, the name of the salesman. Click OK. Notice it's listing only those sales personnel G. So it's uh, fairly easy for both the data filtering and also the data sorting. charts in Excel. We have here a variety of data options in our worksheet and we want to create charts for them. So the concept of creating charts is uh, pretty simple. Basically the way it works is that you select the data and then you click on charts. 
Now the option to create the chart, you can either use this option right here in the bottom under charts, the quick analysis tool that we saw from earlier, or the other option that serves as a better concept is by going here under the insert tab and then choosing recommended charts. Notice there are all kinds of other charts here as well, such as column charts, hierarchy, pie charts, and so on. The idea is uh, to use the right chart for the right type of data representation. Sometimes it's very easy to skew the data by representing it the wrong type of chart. So typically, if you're dealing with percentages, you want to use a pie chart. If you're using with a, a dealing with a long date range, which includes a lot of values and such, then you probably would use a line chart and so on. In Microsoft Excel here, there is also this option of recommended charts. So based on the data that you have selected, it's going to give you what um, Excel recommends in this case. So notice here, I selected part of the column here in the first row as well, and I click OK and that's the chart for just this set of data just toys boomerangs and this in-store sales if i want to tweak that chart even further all i have to do is go and pick some other different designs from here on the top i could also go and pick and change the colors to use a different color scheme and uh, you can also change the layout if you prefer a different layout notice how it's putting the numbers in various areas here through the live preview and you could add different elements as well. Notice the contextual tools here on the top as well. Under the format, you could tweak the formatting, change additional properties for this chart, and also additional options to the right of this chart. Those are some of just the basic concepts on how you create the chart, how you kind of uh, tinker with it. Now, the next thing that I'll try to show you here is that in some cases, you might have in-store sales, website sales, and you have three sets of data. So how do you apply that in a chart? Well, it's the same concept. You select the range of data here and you go under insert and then recommended charts as well. And then pick the recommended type of chart that might come in handy for you. You click OK and here is the grouped chart for this set of data. Now, of course, you can drag this and move it elsewhere in your worksheet where you're working with and customize it even further. The other type of chart that you could create here, here's another example of sales, for example, across multiple years. So in this case, you want to select the data and then you go under insert and then recommended charts again. And notice the first recommended chart that Microsoft recommends here is a line chart because you're dealing with multiple years. You want to see the pattern within those years. So pick the one that you prefer and notice you have the chart right there. Now at this point, as we mentioned earlier as well, you can customize this with uh, various other designs to make it more visually appealing for your audience. Notice you can also switch the rows of the columns and you can change the data selection as well, including the uh, changing the type of chart. Notice under the quick layout, as we discussed earlier, you can include additional values and options within your chart. The next example here, it goes against a year or a complete item. So now uh, we can select this set of data and then go under insert, choose recommended charts. And then at this point, the first option that Microsoft is giving us is the column chart. Because notice if you chose the pie chart here, it will probably not work quite as well because everything is pretty much very closely together. So click on it and there is the column chart for this specific year. Uh, the next option is uh, multiple tests. This is very similar to what we used earlier in this one. And this type of chart, you can simply select it, the data, and then again insert the type of chart. Notice it's a column chart. In some cases, you might want a line chart so that you can see the interactions or interfacing of them accordingly. Now, in the cases where you want uh, to skip a specific area of data in your chart, what you can do, and this is kind of a neat little trick here, 
is uh, basically let's say I want to create a chart only for test one and test three and notice you have test two in the middle what you can do is you hold down the control key while selecting the data range and then at this point you go in under insert and then insert some kind of chart that you may prefer here so let's say I say line chart and I want to compare how one and three is doing and that generates only the tests one and three in this case skipping test number two so again the key there was to hold down the control key while selecting the data range so that's charts in a nutshell feel free to tinker with them of course they can customize them even further and utilize them even more effectively in this session i'm going to demonstrate very briefly how to utilize a couple of the new types of charts these charts are utilized to visualize hierarchical levels of data with ease here so we have this data and what you need to do is you go under insert and then you go to these new types of charts for example the hierarchy chart is to compare parts to a whole or when several columns or categories hierarchy or when several columns or categories form a hierarchy here so we have, for example, the major company here, then you have the sub-companies, and then the subdivisions as well. So what you do here is you click on it, and notice you click on the tree map, and the tree map, as you can see the description right there, it highlights the specific companies and sub-areas to them. It gives us a visual representation based on the data. And notice at this point we can customize this however we want as well in new ways all automatically so that was one of the types of charts the other one is if we go back here to the chart type or we go back to insert chart again the other one is the sunburst which compares values across hierarchy levels shows proportions within the levels as rings so this is another pretty cool one as well additionally there are a couple of new charts for financial analysis that you can utilize to visualize the profits and losses against across financial data for example let's assume that you have this financial income statement here and uh, we select the data and then we go under insert and then we go under the waterfall or stock chart so we choose this one here the stock chart and we'll make this slightly larger and now notice that uh, the gross profit here is the total so we go here under the profit this one right click on it and choose to set it as total what that will do is it will bring it down to the bottom of the chart then we notice also we have operating income that's another total so we find operating income right click set it as a total and then the net income it's another total as well right click set it as total and this gives us a visual view of how everything is performing in our income statement and this is a new type of chart starting in office 2016 or excel 2016. <music>how to use the flash fill feature as we we're tinkering earlier with data here we noticed that for example to calculate the annual income it would be the net pay times 12 for example so it would be f6 times 12 that was our example from earlier we hit the enter and notice this whole area got automatically filled so the calculation that we're going to perform later it uh, got done automatically by the auto fill feature or the flash fill feature in excel 2016 so that was one of the functions of it in flash filling some kind of range of cells that we are potentially were going to auto fill manually later now in this case here we have the email address of a bunch of individuals and we don't have their first and last name let's say we need that for uh, building uh, spreadsheet of sorts so we want to separate those so in this case what you can do is you can start typing here for some of the first name so we want to do Nancy 
and then the next one we type Andrew. Now notice as we are typing Andrew here, it's flash filling. Notice it's matching the rest of the rows. So it's determining what we are doing here in this cell and looking at other subsequent cells and whether it could save us time. And now if we are happy with it, we simply hit enter and notice it's all complete. Now the next one here we put, okay, we say last name. And then we want to do as well the same thing. So we put free. And notice I just started to type the next last name here from this area. And I hit enter. And notice it filled it out automatically. So it's pretty cool, pretty powerful. Now we have two separate uh, columns here that we could use for a mail merge or for other functionality. And that's the flash fill feature. <laughs>
And notice it's, what it's doing is it's referencing this specific worksheet, a specific cell, and notice it's also using an absolute reference. So I click OK. So we name it something meaningful here. It has to start to the lower case and it can't have special characters and any of that type of stuff. And then we click OK. Now notice here in the top left, it's actually now for this reference, it's not gonna be D7, even though you can reference it by whatever D33 here, but it's actually giving it a name. Now if we go here to cross sheet calculations, and we want to post the computer expenses, we could even do it simpler than we did it for these other two options by using the name reference. So now at this point, we are ready to use the name to reference that we uh, saved from earlier. Let's assume we want to go here and call the January expenses. And what we can do is we can simply go under the formulas area and then we choose use in a formula and then call the January expenses from here and then just hit enter. The other option we could have done was we could have hit the equal sign and then just start typing and notice it will pop up as January expenses. Double click on it, hit enter, and it'll pull the value that you had from here. Now if we changed one of those, as this total changes, notice that the total here will change as well. So this is a great way to call references across the worksheet or other worksheets within your workbook or spreadsheet and populate that data for a summary or for various calculations within your spreadsheet. And that was uh, using the two methods, uh, one of them manually by uh, pulling the values the other one was by defining a name for those references. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to calculate percentages in Excel. And I'll have a couple of scenarios here. So the first calculation would be calculating the percentage where a part is calculated against a total amount. For example, in the case of student one scored 87, and there were uh, possible of 100 points, now what is the percentage there? The other one would be the example of a return on investment. For example, you invested a certain amount of money in the, in the stock market or whatever, and at the end of the year you got a certain amount, now what? how many percent? did you gain or lose there? And then the third part would be to calculate the percentage of sales, increasing or decreased sales, and calculate the percentage, for example, on the discount or on an increase toward a whole. So let's go for the first example first here. So we have, uh, for example, student one here, they scored 87% or 87 points, and the total number of points is are going to be against 100. So in this case, we want to represent what was the percentage that they got in this. Of course, we could do this without using an Excel formula, but uh, it's on purpose in this case. So we do equal here, and the way you do that is by uh, the first number. In this case, I'm going to do it manually here, uh, B7 divided by the possible points. So in this case, it will be C7. And then all you do is you hit enter. Now, one thing to remember as well here is that when you're doing the calculation, you need to also format this into a percentage value. So, and this I had done it earlier, so that's how you do it. Basically, just click on the percent item uh, formatting, select the range, and then choose the percent formatting or under here, percentage. So that's the first example. So that came to 87%. So this student scored 87%. Now, this is a little bit more complex. We want to calculate the return on investment percentage. So let's suppose that in the beginning of the year, we invested $1,000. Now at the end of the year, we got $1,200. And we want to determine as to what percentage did we get at the end of the year? What was the return of an investment? Again, format this to be percentages, 
and then you put in the formula. In this case, we're going to do equal sign. Basically, the way we calculate this, if you remember your math and such, we do the end of the year minus the beginning of the year divided by what we invested initially at the beginning of the year. And we have to put that in parentheses. So basically, it would be C16 minus B16. Or you can click on those as well if you wanted to. Divided by the initial investment, which would be B16. And then we hit Enter. Notice the return of an investment on the first one was 20%. And then if we wanted to calculate the next one, you could do it manually or you can do it using the autofill or you can just let Excel 2016 do it for you like it did a moment ago. So if I, another way to do this would be open parentheses, initial uh, end of the year investment minus initial investment and notice it's taking those labels from here, from my table here. That's why I did it manually the first example. Then divide it by the initial investment. Hit enter, it's 25%. And you could repeat this. So in this case, they lost 20% of the investment. So that's how you do the return of investment at the end of the year. That's example number two for calculating percentages. Now, in the third example, we want to calculate, uh, for example, we have uh, these employees, and this is uh, their annual salary that they had, and now we want to give them a bonus, or we want to increase their salary. And, for example, for the first employee, we want to give $1,200 in addition to what they currently had. So now we want to calculate what was the percentage of increase that they got this year. The way to do that uh, calculation would be very similar to the first example. You just uh, do the equal sign and then the bonus divided by the salary. And then hit enter. So they are getting 12%. Uh, the first employee is getting 12%, and the other ones are getting uh, accordingly as we see here. So that would be the percent plus or minus here. The other thing to keep in mind as well, as you are working with these percentages, and besides formatting them in percentages, you might want to have the decimal points to at least two. So we want to increase this by two areas. So, so format all of this by increasing the decimal points for all the cells. So now this is more accurate. For, for example, employee two got 5.95 percent increase in their salary. If you had to figure out as well, for example, you are increasing the salary of employees by 15 percent or 12 percent or whatever, uh, here's how you can uh, do it as well. So basically, so this would be increase. And we're going to put the number statically at this point, but we're going to do the equal sign here, the value times and then the percentage point. So the percentage point in this case it was going to be 0.7%. So that would be 0.7 would be the calculation. Now, if we were to increase everybody's salary by 7%, this is what it would be for each one of them. Now, if we wanted to, to know how much is their total salary going to be, we could go back and modify our formula to be um, the salary times 1.07 because we just want to see what it went above what they are earning earlier. So hit enter there and notice now the new salary at 7% increase, it's going to be 10,700 here and so on. So the idea that I wanted to demonstrate here was how to calculate it by a specific percentage so you can see just the increase and this would be by adding the one in front of it that would be what would be the new total for that employee so that you can kind of save another column to add numbers and all that stuff but you're doing it all in one cell for this calculation so hopefully that is helpful there these were three different scenarios on calculating percentages in excel and it should cover pretty much most of the 
uh, scenarios out there. For you. In this next session, we are going to learn about using logical functions as part of a formula in Excel. We are going to learn about three different ways of how to utilize the if statement within a formula. The first way will be that if the employees here reach $20,000 in sales, then for those that reach 20 or more, then they can get $250 bonus. And then in this case, we are going to say, yes, that is true for George and Michael and Darius and so on. Then the next uh, set here in the next column, we're going to display yes or no. We're going to represent it with a yes or no, the words yes or no. And then in the third column, we're going to actually post the amount that they get as additional. This is how it works. So basically you have the sales that they accomplished as part of the worksheet. Then you have the criteria that you're determining. This is the criteria. It could be $20,000. It could be $100,000. And then here you're saying this is how much they will get if they pass that criteria. To use the if statement, we can do it by going here under Formulas tab. And then we click on Insert Function. You can also click here under Logical and use the if function as well. But we'll use the longer way to start here. So we go here under the if function and then you could just type if. Now in our case it's actually showing up automatically here so if it was not then it's going to bring it up. Now if it says it checks whether a condition is met and it returns one value if it's true and another value if it's false. So that's what we want to do here. We want to say post the words true or false. So we click on it and now it says, what is the logical test? The logical test, so we have to say, if the sales, if these guys here, for John, if the sales, that's if B6, is greater than or equal to the criteria, then if that is true, we want to post in there the words true. Because notice we have true or false. We're going to just put the words true. Or you could say it is true. If it, so basically you can put whatever you want. If not, false. Now the other thing to do here is to keep in mind, notice that this bonus criteria here, we don't want that to change. And if you remember from the types of references, we want to make that an absolute reference. So you press the F4 key to put the dollar signs so that when you use the autofill feature, that does not populate the other cells incorrectly. So we want to lock it to the criteria of 20,000. So again, so far what we did here, if B6, this value, is greater or equal to 20,000, which is B12, then we're going to post the words it is true. Otherwise, we're going to post the words false. And then the other thing we did, we just used the absolute reference. Then we click OK. Notice it says it's true. He made $20,382. Now we use the autofill feature here to move down to the other ones. And it says George here, he got only 19000 So he doesn't get the bonus and so on. So that was one method. The other method is to post here yes or no. The words actually yes or no. It's going to be very similar to the previous option here that we did. So we click here on insert function under the formulas tab. We click on if, OK. And then we, again, we say pretty much what we did earlier. We click on the reference here. If B6 is greater than equal to, to the criteria. 12, we make that an absolute reference by pressing F4, then we put here yes. If it's false, no. And then click OK. Notice the first one they did, they get a bonus, the other ones they don't get a bonus. Now, on the third option here, on the third reference, we are going to post the actual amount, which would be this amount. So, and if they didn't get it, 
then we put a zero in there. So uh, again, we go under the formulas tab, click on insert function, and then the if function, then we say if this reference b6 greater or equal to the criteria, make it an absolute value, then they get the bonus, which is b13. Now we want to do that as an absolute reference as well, otherwise they get zero. And then we click OK, and notice the first one gets a $250 bonus, the other ones they get accordingly. And of course, if we are doing additional calculations here, you could have another column here to calculate the totals and for their income and such. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to utilize pivot tables in Excel. Pivot tables are a powerful feature of Excel. There are a couple requirements that you need to know before you start tinkering with them and finding that they don't work. The first thing is that the first row should contain the field names for the data that you are analyzing and working with. The second thing is that the records or individual transactions must be in rows, very similar to this, for example, the region and all that type of thing. Then the third option is that uh, there should be no blank cells or rows within the data that you're evaluating. So you have to make sure that there is something in every one of them. And fourthly, the data must be surrounded by blank columns, meaning you have nothing in the immediate space to where your data is. So to utilize the pivot tables, what you do is basically select the data. And then of course, you can use this uh, quick analysis tool here if you need it to. And once you select the, all the data, you go under insert, and then you go under pivot table. You could also choose here, and this is new in 2000, Excel 2016, you could choose recommended pivot tables. And then in this case, notice uh, it's gonna customize it by region sum of costs of goods sold by region or by sum of sales by specific individuals or count by products and so on. So you could kind of tinker with any of these options as well by using the recommended uh, tables here. But uh, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just click on the pivot table here so you get the idea. And what it's going to do is it's going to create, this is the selection that we're going to use and it's going to create a new worksheet for us to work with and massage and tinker with this data. Click OK here. And now at this point, we could tinker with then any of these options. So let's say we want to see by region. And notice it built the table here by it put all the different regions. Then let's say we wanted to see by customers. So now notice we have the region here, Midwest. And now we have all the different customers or companies for each one of those. And then we want to see, let's say the cost of goods sold. That would be the next one. And then sales as well. So now we can kind of get an idea here. So we have that data all kind of in a big mess. Now we can make more sense out of it by sorting it out and utilizing, let's say the first one we said here, we used the region. Then we wanted the company for each region and then the sales within each region. Now, of course, you could sort this and do all, all kinds of other stuff. Now, by clicking on this drop down here, you can also choose to exclude certain areas and so on. So that was one type of uh, pivot table there. If we click here again, we can go in and change this. And uh, let's say we don't want it by, by region anymore. Now we want it by sales rep. So sales rep, notice uh, first we have here uh, the companies. And if we want to change the order, we just drag it further up. The sales rep to make the sales rep first. And if you want it to filter by a specific region, you can add the filter up here. So I can drag the 
a region for example and make it as a filter and then I can pick here whichever region I want it will show me only that specific region I'm filtering it only for that specific region and if I wanted to see only the sales by a specific salesperson I can simply pick here the sales rep and then pick the additional fields that I want so I can choose a product and see what product they sold and the, the totals and that type of thing and then if I wanted a specific field to be sorted by or filtered by I could even pick uh, add it to the rows here and then choose to sort it at some point later to utilize that field for filtering as uh, you work with pivot tables it's basically going to be a matter of you what you want it to look like what you're looking for in that pivot table and how you want to sort and massage that table for the data that you want notice there is an option here as well for more tables so you could click on yes to that and basically in this case you can choose to analyze for example by industry or by company and you can even choose to detect relationships if there were any and things of that nature remember also that once you are in the pivot table already you can choose here from the options for pivot tables you can pick from one of those predefined ones as well maybe you want sales by region okay there is a sales by region of course you might want the sales rep there is a sales rep as well that you just added and you want to put also the customers then eventually and now you have the sales by region by a salesperson and the items that were sold and then you can also add this product within each one of those now this as you're working with a pivot table so let's say you have this type of uh, table that you created here using the pivot options here on the right hand side and what you can do as well is that you can create a pivot chart so it's basically going to take the information from this and build a chart out of it so notice I pick the pivot chart pick any of those designs click OK and now it built a chart for us based on the selected data pivot tables again are very powerful tinker with it from the different angles and utilize even the charts within them as well. VLOOKUP is a very powerful function and the feature of Excel that comes in very handy whether you're a professional and using Excel heavily or whether you're a student or some casual user of Excel particularly one of those that uh, wants to advance in the career so it's basically the VLOOKUP it looks up for values for any item on the right hand side or in the, on any of the columns next to the item for example if we want to look up the price of apples so that would be one way to utilize this and uh, it's also used commonly in large tables uh, for uh, getting data from one worksheet to another one in a custom way so in this case I'm going to explain it in a very simple way first and then we'll move into the more complex usage of this tool V it stands for the vertical lookup the vertical lookup of the data so the columns here will be the vertical pieces so let's say we want to look up the price of apples so we type here apples and then we just start with a formula now to enter the formula I'll show you how to do this a couple ways uh, one of the ways is to go here under formulas you go under insert function and then you find the function here VLOOKUP you can type it up here and then uh, it should show up after you type it double click on it and then it says what value do you want to look up so here we want to look up the apples so you just click here on A4 so that's the value that we want to uh, look up at this point and then the next piece of data that we need to enter here would be the array the table part of it so we want to look up the data from uh, the whole range here now of course we could have used also a named reference which I'll try to cover in a moment but for now we're just picking the data so we want the computer to look up the whole table with all the data typically again it would be much more data than here 
Then it says, which column do you want to look up for apples? So in this case, we want to look up the price, which would be the fruit here, apples, it's the first column, and B here, the second column, and then C would be the third column. In our case, we want to look up column B, the price. So we put two here. Then the range lookup, if you want the exact uh, data, you want to choose false. And in most of the cases, that's the most commonly used one until you figure out true works, how the function or the option for true works. But for now, we are just going to pick false here and then click OK. Now notice it says apples, the price of apples is 5,000. Now also notice here the uh, VLOOKUP formula. Or we have the A4, it's the apples. We have the um, range here for the whole table. Then we are choosing column two. So if for some reason we wanted to display what the vendor is for, for apples. So you just put there number three to look it up on um, uh, column number three, then hit enter and notice it's displaying us the data for the company in this case. Again, uh, hopefully it makes sense here. Uh, the idea is a large spreadsheet and look up there are certain pieces of data that you need. The other way that you can do this is by using a drop down. So this would be another easy example here. You could uh, create a drop down list here. So you could say fruit and then to the right we're going to have a drop down. Now to create a drop down we go here under data and then we go under data validation and then we click on data validation again and then we choose a drop down list. Now on the drop down list you can specify the source and you can use the source of those uh, types of fruit here. So if we click here on source and then go and select here the drop down list it's basically saying that I want all those items to be listed in my drop down list at this stage. Then you click OK and then at this point notice we have a drop down list. So then next to it we want to specify let's say the price. Now we can look up the price of any of the fruits, notice the fruits will be here in the drop down, by simply using the VLOOKUP function. You can use the lookup function by, like I showed it a moment ago, or you can do it by using the formula manually here. So you do equal sign and then start typing VLOOKUP. Once it comes up, press tab to move to the next part of it. The next component is what do you want to look up basically? So here we want to look up whatever we choose from our drop down list, which is this field right here at this point, the F3. So if we chose apples, then we want to look up the price of apples. So we are using a drop down in this case, and the drop down, whatever value we picked from there, that's what it'll be. Then we put a comma here, and then we pick the range of the data. So the range here would be looking up all the data that we want, looking it up in a specific table or in a specific part of the spreadsheet. So we just put in the range in there. Then we put a comma and then we want to specify which column or which piece of data do we want to look up for the item that we pick. So if we pick bananas, do we want the amount or do we want the wow, Which column is it? So here we put number two because that will be column number two for the uh, amount. And then we put false whether we want an exact match or approximate match. So exact match would be false, typing the word false. It kind of doesn't make sense how Excel is doing it, but that's how it is. Then you hit enter. Now notice right now it says, well, there is an error. There is nothing applicable. However, if you go here now to the drop down list and you choose bananas, notice it gives us the price of bananas. Then if we choose a different product, let's say lemons, that's uh, $4,000 or whatever. So this would come in very handy with looking up data by using a drop-down list. So this is one way that you can use VLOOKUPs in business. Now, you can also create here for the range that if you see here that we did the range by using the CA4 and C2 and such you can give it a name. So we call it fruit data. Now, 
if we go and create here, for example, another VLOOKUP, because we can use it for multiple options, let's say we want also the vendor. We do equal VLOOKUP tab, then we want the item that we have, the type of fruit, then press comma, then you can put the reference by using the fruit data that we specified earlier for this range. So basically we are representing the range by using a name for that whole selection. Then comma, then we specify we want the column three data. So we put three and then false and then close parentheses. So now if I go and choose here my type of fruit and I say okay I want to look up bananas, where do we get bananas from? And notice it's displaying the data. So again the idea is that you can have, a, can have a large spreadsheet here with lots of data and you can have one of those lookups to get you the data that you want. Now another way to use VLOOKUP is let's say you have a spreadsheet like this and again you can use here a drop down so you can look up employees information by using a drop down very similar to how I did in the previous example or you can generate a custom list with specific pieces of data from this sheet. So in this next example I'm going to demonstrate how to pull data from another worksheet and post on this sheet only the, the fields that we want for specifically for the mail merge or for whatever reason. Now one of the things to keep in mind is, is that uh, it's typically best to give a name for the range of data that you're searching or utilizing in your search select uh, the first row here, hold down the control and shift key and hit the down arrow that will select all your data to the very end. Then you go and give it a name. In this case I called it employee data. You can call it whatever you want but it's called. So whenever we call it up or reference it, it will be employee data. So the first thing, let's put the employee IDs and this can work the same with a chart of accounts or whatever else that you might have on that referencing worksheet. So here we are first going to post the employee IDs. So we'll hit the equal sign here. We're not using a VLOOKUP so far. We're just posting what's on the other worksheet here uh, for the employee ID number. And then we hit enter. So you know, this ID, employee ID is 1001. Next we want to get now using a VLOOKUP function we want to get the actual first name for that employee ID. So we want to go here under first name on that cell and then start our VLOOKUP formula. Do the equal sign, then the function VLOOKUP, then tab, then after we do VLOOKUP, we want to look up this field, this data, this piece of data right here the for customer 1001 or employee 1001 and then we want to look up in the range, so we put a comma here then we put employee data which is our selection of data from the spreadsheet and then we put in there the column that has the data that we want if we go back here and look it's going to be column Two. So we have one, two for the first name. So we put in here number two and then false in order to get the exact match and then close parentheses. And notice the customer's first name is Owen in this case. If we go and look over here, it's Owen. Now we get also the last name a similar way. So we do equal sign, V lookup tab the uh, reference point in the range it's going to be our employee data then it's going to be column 3 if you remember from the spreadsheet a moment ago and then false close parentheses hit enter Owen Hayes that's the um, last name now we want to get the email address posted so notice it's going to be we need to determine which column it is uh, vertically here so one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's the ninth column. So if we go back here again, we can create again another lookup for the email address. So equal sign, the lookup, this is our reference point, then the employee 
data, then the column was the ninth column, and then false. If for some reason you make a mistake, you can always choose a different column and hit enter. So notice we have the email address now. Now we could have gotten this as well by copying the formula and just changing the column. Now, in this case, you can actually to duplicate this across uh, for all your other customers, you can select these cells here and then just drag these down. And now the system is going to replicate the same data. And notice now we have the data here posted and we can use this for a mail merge. We can send it to whoever. So it's kind of like creating a report from a larger spreadsheet. We are looking up data from a larger spreadsheet or a worksheet. Now, if we change somebody's name and such, that data will be updated automatically in my lookup here. So notice it has been updated. So this is another cool way of utilizing this to replicate the data from one worksheet to another one with just the pieces of data that you want. Now, of course, you could use here a drop-down menu if you prefer as well and uh, have, for example, employee number. And then right next to it, you can have a drop-down menu. Let's say in here we want the salary. First name, last name, salary. And then you'd put in there the employee number. The way to get the first name again would be equal sign, V lookup. And then we want to look up whatever we enter in here. The reference point, then the range. I'm double clicking to move to the next thing. Then um, we choose there the second column because uh, if you remember from earlier, the second column was actually the data that had the first name. And then false close parentheses, hit enter. Now this right now, it's not happy with us because we have not entered anything in the employee number. If we go here and look at the employee numbers, notice 1001, 1002, and whatever, we can go here and put in 1001 for the employee, and it gives us the name Sally. Then if you go and um, do a V lookup again for the last name, so you can do that again with the formula here. So V lookup, we want to look up whatever this is a point of reference, comma, the range, then um, last name, it was the third column, and then false, close parentheses, and then you post also the salary. So if we have here 1005 at this point, notice it's bringing up the data. For the salary, this will, we have to count the fields here. So it's so we go here on the VLOOKUP, and we do another VLOOKUP here. Equal sign, VLOOKUP, the reference point, the data, the column, false. Then hit Enter. Now, in this case, it did not work because we didn't have the data in the right fields. Notice we have a couple empty fields here. So our, the salary data is actually on field 10, 11, 12, so number 12. So that's why it did not work. So we go and change that to number 12, and now we have the data for that. Then format this appropriately, and there it is. So basically, this is like a lookup form for you for specific types of data. So, so far, we did three examples. So, so you're looking up prices up here by using a drop-down on the type of fruit and such, and getting the data. We looked up specific columns of data, and we built a, a new list using data from another sheet. These could be account numbers and such. And then this other example here was entering a specific employee ID. Another final tool here would be this example. So let's say we have the April expenses or donations, and then we go to, and we got some additional data for May donations. And we want to kind of merge those. So one of the ways to do that would be uh, just copy this data and create another sheet with the May data here. And we can just refer to this as May. You can also select this data here and that whole range of it, just call it May. Now here, we want to the May donations. So we are merging the data from two separate sheets in this case. 
and we do VLOOKUP, the column or the field that we want to look up is this right here. Then the data that we want to look up is basically what was in May, that whole set of data, so we, we named it May data. And then we want column two because that was uh, the donations for May in the May uh, worksheet. And then we say false, close parentheses, hit enter, and notice for the first one it's saying not applicable. So the reason for that is uh, because Tacy course does not exist on this May sheet. Now, if we replicate this or we uh, use the autofill feature, notice it's posting the donations from May. So, for example, notice Denise, she donated $30. If we go over here, that's $30. And then we can format this in currency and clear that out that doesn't have any data. So that's how you can kind of merge multiple data sources or sheets to build a new one by looking up the data on various other ones. In this last example, we are going to learn how to use VLOOKUP, the closest match, and that is utilizing the true option here at the end of our formula. In this example, we are going to use determining commissions for our sales individuals, and this has multiple other uses as well. It's important to note here is that uh, first we have to have a commission table. So we are going to determine what the tiers are and then those numbers here as well need to be within the specific ranges. Let's go ahead and test this. Also, th these numbers need to be within um, an increasing number. They need to be in a sorted order, basically. So here we have the individuals and their sales for the month. And then we're going to post in here via VLOOKUP their commissions for that specific month or the sales. First, our data range that we are going to use as the searching criteria to compare it against. Let's first name that as a named ref. And you can name that to whatever you want. Now, at this point, we are going to enter the formula over here. So basically, we are going to look up the values that are in here as a point of reference. And then we are going to compare it against the values in our commission table and then have the system determine what commission they will receive. And we'll do this, of course, with a VLOOKUP function and using the TRUE option, getting the approximate or the closest match. So we'll do the equal sign, VLOOKUP, tab. This is our starting value, our point of reference, basically, that well, the value that we are going to compare. And we're going to compare it against this range over here. We called it earlier commission range. Then we are going to have the system post what's on column two. So this will be our payout rate. So that will be in column two. And then the function here is going to be an approximate match because Unless we specified 50,000 or 100,000 and such, it's not going to work otherwise. So we're going to use here the true function. Or you can double click here on the approximate match, true, close parentheses, hit enter. And now we have here the value for VLOOKUP for Melissa. Her sales were higher than $200,000. Therefore, her commission is going to be $400,000. Then, of course, we could format this range into currency. And then, instead of doing this V lookup for all the other cells, we can just use the autofill feature. And now we should have the determination here for all the commissions for each individual. And that's how using V lookup for determining the commissions works. And also, this is utilizing the true function because the other examples that we utilized were using the exact match. This is the approximate match from the specific range. Now, of course, if their sales changed, so let's say she got only 110,000 in sales, notice her commission will change as well. session I'm going to demonstrate how you can use predefined drop-down lists as somebody or your assistant or you're entering data in Excel 
so that the data that you entered is consistently spelled and it's consistently listed correctly based on a previously defined list. So in this case, let's say we have a sales rep and you have four or five salesmen and you're constantly entering and re-entering those names and you want to make sure that those names are all the time spelled appropriately. So what you can do is, and you can use this for products and other things as well, what you can do is in another sheet in your spreadsheet here, you can just create the names, define the names. So we have Hubert, Mark, John, Samantha, and Mimi, and so on. So now here, when you're entering it, you want always Hubert to be spelled correctly or to have a drop-down list of names. So we have this uh, column here. So now what you do is you go under data here. Under data, you want to do data validation. So basically the data validation in this case is that it picks from a list of rules to limit the type of data that can be entered in a cell. It can be numbers, it can be a list of names and so on, like I mentioned earlier. So we click on data validation and we choose data validation here. And then under what to allow, you, right now it's to allow any value in this column. However, we can go here under choose and choose a list, only a list of predefined names can be allowed to be entered in there. So then we go here and it's saying, where is your source? Where is your list of data? And then you simply go to the sheet that has the list of names. In this case, it's sheet number four for me. And we go over right here. Now you could pick a little bit of extra space here so that if you add another name in the future, you have the capability without having to change the de design of the spreadsheet. You can leave some of the blank areas here. So then we click OK. And now notice we are back to sheet number three. So now we are entering sales reps instead of you typing Tom. Notice it doesn't allow you to do that. It says a user has restricted values that can be entered here. So now you have this drop down list. You have Hubert, Mark, John, and so on. So we click on Hubert and then you put the date and the item and all that type of stuff. Of course, date shouldn't be allowed like that either. So you can customize that for the next one. So you go to the next one and next one and so on. Now, if for some reason you wanted to add another client or salesperson, remember we had we specified a couple extra cells here. So we go here, we added it on the list. Now we go back and over here, Jonathan is listed as one of the salespeople. So you can use this for products, predefined products for your salespeople and so on. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to use one of the simple but yet important features in Excel, particularly when you're using a lot of data that you want to navigate. So for example, let's say that we have this data file here or this uh, worksheet. And as we scroll down, notice how we lose track of what uh, the headers are here. Also, as we move from left to right, notice that we lose track of what the first column is here. The question is, how can we make it so that actually the, the header and the first column stay put? Well, there are a couple ways to do it. The first way is uh, basically we could lock only the, uh, the header row here, just the top one. So what you can do is you go under the View tab and you go under the Freeze panes and that is the feature that you want to use in this case. So you could choose Freeze Top Row and in this case, notice as we scroll down, the top row stays put and we can navigate up and down. However, if we were to go left and right, in this case, it's still not locked this first column. So to correct the problem, what we do is we go here to the very top again, and then we click right below the first row that we want to keep uh, locked and also right uh, to the right on the next column for the column that we want to lock. So once we select the cell that we want to keep as a key point for locking both the column and the row, then we go here under freeze panes, and then we simply click on freeze panes. At this point, we can scroll up and down and the top row will stay 
unlocked and we can scroll from left to right and the column on the left will stay locked. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to set the print area in a worksheet in Excel. Typically, in a Word document, uh, you press print and it either the whole document prints out or a selection or a specific page prints out. In Excel, it's slightly different due to the spreadsheets being quite large and typically a worksheet can contain up to a million records. So uh, if you wanted to print only a specific area of your worksheet, you need to set what's called the print area. Right now, I've not set the print area yet in this one. So if we wanted to look as to what it will uh, print out or look for printing, if we go here under file and then choose print, this is how it will print out. And it's going to print those pages just like that. But suppose I want only a specific chart or a specific area here to be printed out. In this case, what you have to do is go and select the area that you want to print out here. So let's say I want only this portion right here to be printed out. I can simply select this then go under page layout and then choose under print area and then click on set print area. And at this point, if I go to file, and print. Notice that my preview, it'll print only that specific section. Now to clear the print area for if you do not need that any longer, you click here on print area again, and then choose clear print area. And then you'd have to set it again for other pages or other sections of your worksheet. <music> In this session, I'll briefly show you how to link data from, a, from an Excel spreadsheet into a Word document for the purpose of reports and so on. So there are a couple ways to take data from Excel and then utilize it in Microsoft Word. So let's see if we can demonstrate it very quickly here. So we go to Word and let's say this is my report. Let's say I have to do this report monthly and I have to take data from Excel and, and put it in my report for whether it is expenses or it could be whatever else. So one of the ways to get the data from Excel into Word is by simply clicking on saving this. So copying it from Excel and then I'm right clicking and choose copy or control C or however you copy stuff or click on copy and paste up here. And then I go back to Word and then I'm going to paste it. Now notice by simply pasting it in Word, it does not look anywhere close to what it was in Excel. Of course, I could go here and choose to use the destination or the keep the source formatting. So that's one way. It's not the greatest way. Now what you can do is you can actually link the data with the Excel spreadsheet. So once you link it once as the data is updated from time to time from Excel from your assistant or whoever else out there, that report it's always up to date, all you have to do is open up the document and it will be up to date. So for that to work, what you do is you go into Excel, into Excel, we copy and we select and copy the data. So I'm just copying it again. Those bars were there because I had copied it from before. Now we go back to Word and we click here under Paste, but instead of just choosing Paste, we are going to click on Paste Special. So choose Paste Special and then we're going to paste it as a link. So we are going to link it with Microsoft Excel. So it's linked to an Excel spreadsheet object. So basically, the data is not really residing. It's, of course, posted in the document, but it's linked with the Excel document. So I'll demonstrate in a moment here. Since we pasted it, 
we can assume that the report is done. We're going to save it. And we're going to save it on the desktop. I call it this my monthly report. Now a month has passed by or whatever time has passed by. And notice my, uh, let's say my training expense for January in the previous report was $100 before. Now I'm going to make it $123. Now if I go to my document and let's say I'll save it. Let's assume that a few months passed by. Now I go into my report. Double click on it. Notice the first thing that you'll get is it says this document contains links that refer to other files. Do you want to update this document or the data from the linked files? It's saying it's linked to Excel. Do you want this to be updated? So I say yes. And now this is my older junk here that I had from before. But notice the expense here for January for 123 has been updated. So the idea is that whatever you change here in Excel as you're keeping track of things, it will be automatically posted and linked with Microsoft Word because we linked that data earlier. So if I go into Word, close it, and then save the Excel changes that I made, open it up again, say yes to update it, Again, ignore this part. Notice even the formatting has been updated from Excel. So it's a pretty neat tool. It's highly recommended that you utilize it in your work. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to import data from a CSV file or a text file. The CSV files are used quite a bit in larger businesses and corporations for transferring data between systems. It's a common file format that is utilized for transferring files. So this is an example of a CSV file. It's called CSV because it's comma separated values. So notice these would be the columns the system will know where the columns are separated by the comma when we bring this into Excel. So let's go back and we'll try to import that. Let me take note where it is located. Now the way you bring it in is by clicking on file, click on open, and then go and find the file basics. So we'll go under my computer or computer, click on browse, we'll go under downloads, go wherever it is located, and we're going to choose here to show us all files. So notice it's in voices list. Double click on it. Now you'll be presented with this wizard. Basically it's saying this is a CSV file or comma or delimited uh, text delimited file. So we are telling it, okay, it's text delimited. Usually you'd know that by whoever, wherever you got the, of course, the file to tell you what whether it's comma delimited or tab delimited it could be either one of them. Now you check this option here for my data has headers. What that means is that the first row of your data actually has the labels as to what that column stands for. Then we click on next. Then we tell the system that this is comma separated values. So the commas are what separate each field. Uh, if it was tab uh, delimited or semicolon delimited or something else, uh, you'd choose that. But uh, most of them are usually comma separated. Then you click on next. Then you could specify additional types of formatting here. Usually it's not necessary. And then you click on finish. Now at this point, that data from a text file has been imported into Excel. And notice I'm double clicking between the columns to make them fit correctly. Notice it's much cleaner. And now you can tinker with this data. You can create charts. You can create whatever you want to create, filter it and all that type of stuff. You save it. It's done. Let's choose save as here. Browse where we want to save it. And then we don't want it as tab delimited. We want to save it as an Excel file. So we go here under Excel workbook and give it a name. It's going to name it listed as invoices list, which is fine. 
and now it's an Excel format just like any other Excel spreadsheet. Now at this point, if for some reason, let's assume this is a spreadsheet that you created in Excel. Now you want to send it to somebody in comma separated values, very similar to how we got it earlier. Now we click on file, choose save as, and then click on browse. Under this, the save as file type, this is where you tell it that it's going to be CSV comma delimited file. Click on CSV, give it a name, and then click on save. And you want to keep using it, say yes. If we were to go back to that folder, notice it's with commas. So that's how you bring a file in. You bring it in from CSV and you export into a CSV. session I'm going to demonstrate how to perform a mail merge in Microsoft Word. The process is actually very similar to other versions of Microsoft Word as well. It's not identical. However, I'm going to go over it here in Office 2016. So let's say I have this long document here and I want to do a mail merge and send this to individual software. For now, I'm going to create a new page here. I'm going to insert a new page and I'm going to put their information in there for my clients, let's say. So in this case, I'm going to go under insert and I'm going to insert a page break. So just so that I have a blank page here to start with. And then in here, I'm going to make it so that this document can be customized for each individual. It has their address and their name and some kind of information as well. And by the way, this doesn't have to be a document like this. It can be a blank document, a letter that you sent. It could be invoices. It could be whatever notices that you send out there. It's very similar to letters that you receive from various companies out there that have your name on top of it. You have to have a document in Word and you have to have an Excel document as well. And that's best to use Excel. Of course, you can have other options as well. So let's assume this is the list of my customers. I have their first name, last name, the street address. Of course, this is all fictitious, the zip code, and then a bunch of email addresses. And you could have also comment one, two, three. So this would be customized, personalized comments. So, so this is what the comment that I could write, for example, for customer one. Now, customer two, I would say, and so on. Now, one key thing to remember as well as you build your list in Excel is that uh, the first row here needs to have the field names or it's best to have the field names. So first name, last name, telephone, street address and keep those separate as well if you can. Keep as many fields as you want here or columns with comments because you can utilize this for multiple mail merges and the way you'll be doing it is that you can link the same data file and you keep on updating this from month to month and you link it to the same report or the same mail merge that you do for your customers. So in this case, let's say we are all good to go here. We have maintained this list. This is our customer list and so on. Notice that the tab here on the bottom, it says customer. So now I'm going to save it. I'm going to close it and then I'm going to go back to my document. Now in here, I want to create a new mail merge. So I go under mailings. And then I go under start mail merge. And the best thing to do is, or what I'd suggest that you do is click on step-by-step -step mail merge wizard. In here, notice that there is pane in the right-hand side shows up and it asks you, do you want to create letters, email address, email messages, envelopes, labels, and so on. You can do emails and that's a powerful feature. And I'll try to demonstrate that in another video here or actual letters like the old days that you used to do, print them in a paper and stuff them in an envelope and send them and that type of thing. So for now, we're going to learn how to do letters. We click on next step to start the document. It says, do you want to use the current document that we have opened here? Or do you want to start from a template or do you want to use an existing document that you have from some other time? So I say, I want to use the current one. And then the next step here is to select the recipients. Now it says, do you want to use an existing list or do you want to create a new list? In our case, we are going to use an existing list, that Excel file that I opened a moment ago. Also, you can use Outlook if you use Microsoft Outlook as well. Now, 
type in your list. You can do it from here from Microsoft Word. However, I'd recommend create the list in Excel if you're going to have to create a new list because it's much easier to manage in the future and update. So we click here on uh, use an existing list. We click on browse and then we have to find the file. So now we scroll up here and I'm going to go to Word 2016 and this is my customer list for the mail merge. I click on open. That's my Excel file basically. And here is my customer table. Notice there are two sheets in there, but I want to use, remember I mentioned earlier, customer. Click OK. Now notice this is the list of all the customers in that Excel spreadsheet. You could also sort them a certain way if you wanted. So you can sort them alphabetically by first name, by last name, and all that type of thing. And then you can also filter them if you needed to. So let's say you want only by a specific zip code or by a specific criteria and so on. You could basically simply click on filter and choose a field name. And uh, let's say here's a zip. And you would say zip equal to some number or greater than some number and so on. So in this case, I'm going to cancel that. You could uh, find duplicates to avoid sending duplicates. And then you simply click on OK here. At this point, we are ready. We have told the system that we're going to use the existing document and an existing list. Now the next thing it says, write your letter. Now in my letter here, it's saying, well, put in your address block. I could put this by clicking on it, or we could insert the fields manually. I would recommend that you tinker with it manually. So you could say, dear, and then choose here, the insert field option so dear first name the computer will put the first name in there then you go to the next line here and then you start writing your letter basically now the other thing that you could do is in here you could put their address so that it will be part of the envelope or however it's going to show up so we click here under insert field first name space last name and then insert field street address city comma state and the zip now those look coded but the computer is going to pull them one by one and match them with the excel spreadsheet so don't panic on that now in here you would write your letter you'd say below is the annual report for your investments let's assume this is an investment report and uh, if you have any concerns please contact us you could also insert here remember in excel we had a comments field you could put a comments field in here now at this point you put your name there you could also insert an image if you needed to or a logo or whatever part of your uh, it's going to be duplicated across all the pages now at this stage you could simply actually save this if you were to save it at this point and you'd give it a name now the next step is the reason why i saved it is because you could at any point open this and it's going to pull your data automatically from your excel file if you needed to do another mail merge in six months or whatever now, the next thing here, notice it says preview your letters. So notice it says, this is the address, Alex, and so on. And you could kind of preview them right here. Next, next, next. Now, a lot of people, they stop here. But you need to finish to complete your merge. You can click here under complete merge. And then... You can either choose to print them or edit individual letters. Notice there's also a finish and merge option on the top here as well. So in my case, particularly what I usually prefer to edit individual letters. And then I'm going to choose all of them. Now it's going to take a little while because I had 29 pages here and I have a lot of customers. So notice now we have one letter or long report for every one of the customers here. So notice we have here, the first one is for Alex. And now we have to keep on scrolling because this is a long report. And now here's Amber. 
It's the next customer. And again, like I mentioned, it's going to be a long one. So suppose you have two or three pages, and this will be much more meaningful. But basically, we're creating a personalized report here for each one of the customers. And here's for the next third one. Keep in mind, again, the key there is that this is the output at this stage. If we were to look at the documents that I have opened here, and apparently I have many of them, but this is the one with merged results. It says letters, one word. Uh, this we can actually uh, trash it after we are done with it. We don't need to save it unless you need it for documentation purposes. This is our form. So at this point, if I close this, open this again, notice it prompts you, it says this, opening this document will run the following commands. Select from customer order by first name and last name. Do you want to update it? Yes. And now it's linking it to the Excel file. Now at any point we can go here under mailings and it's ready, we can simply click on finish and merge and it's going to merge all of those just like it did earlier. Keep in mind again before I end this session that you can always update the Excel file and you can always reuse the form file. The results page, the merged results, you don't necessarily need to save them unless you need to keep them for documentation purposes as to what you sent out. In this session, we're going to learn about using financial functions in Excel. And particularly, we're going to focus on three of them at this point, as we know there are hundreds of them, and for the sake of time, we can't cover all of them. So the first one is PMT, which is the interest payment for a period on a loan. Then the IPMT is the interest payment over a period of time. And then the PPMT is the principal payment for a specific period that you are calculating. As we learned earlier, uh, the way to uh, find out how to use that specific function is by going to, let's say over here, we want to insert a function and then we search as to what we want to search for. So for example, PMT first. And notice PMT, it says it calculates the payment for a loan based on a constant payments and a constant interest rate. So we click, uh, you can also click on help on this function. It will go to Microsoft and it will explain this further by uh, explaining the syntax for it and some examples and remarks and all that type of thing. You can explore these for yourself as well, but uh, the way it will work here is that um, for PMT, for example, it needs these values in black here. So we need to figure out the rate. What is the interest rate per month. So the key there, it's going to be per month. So notice I have this working area down here. So the interest rate, when you get a loan, it would be, let's say, $19.99 or 5% or 3% loan that you're receiving. But yet the rate that the computer needs, it's per month. Therefore, we need to do a little bit extra calculations here. The NPER, it is the number of payments that you are going to be paying. Uh, for example, if you're getting a loan for five years, that would be a 60 months. And uh, if you are getting a home loan for 30 years, that would be 360 months. And then the PV, it's the present value. And that means how much is your loan? You're getting a $100,000 loan or a $10,000 loan and so on. So the actual total amount that you are borrowing. But before we do any of these calculations, we need to have some sub-calculations, for example, for the rate that needs to be for the month. The easiest would be to utilize uh, something very similar to this to lay this out. So you say my interest rate is, let's say, 5%. And you have to format this in percent before you forget to do that. Click on percent here. Then it says interest payments per year. That's like your number of payments that you're going to make for a year. That would be 12 in this case. And then the interest payment per month. Now you're calculating this by dividing C13, which is the percent rate, divided by 12 or by the number of payments. So we could actually, instead of using 12 there, we could have used 
the actual reference for it, which would be C14. And then we hit enter. Now notice the other trick here as well is that we are calculating this with uh, a bunch of increased numbers or values here because uh, I think in the business world they use up to five digits after the period. So here we have a little bit more than that but we could kind of control it by this right there. So that would be our payment interest rate per month in this case. Then the number of years. We are taking the loan for five years and that means it's going to multiply C14, which is the number of payments per year, times the number of years, and it's giving us the NPR, which is the number of payments. And then the PV is the total amount that we are borrowing. In this area here, we are going to calculate the PMT. So now what we do in this case, we go here under formulas, insert function, and we find the PMT option, click OK, and then we go here under rate. Well, rate, all we have to do is click on the C15, because we calculated it already. NPER, it's 60 in this case, so we click on C17, and then the PV, we click on the value here for the amount and then leave everything alone. We click OK and it comes to $188.71 for $10,000 for five years at 5%. Now, if we were going to borrow this for 15%, notice it went to $237 over five years. Now, if we were borrowing a loan for a house for $300,000, and we are paying it over 30 years, our payment at 15% would be $3,793. But yet, for uh, mortgage rates at this point, they're not 15%, fortunately. They might be about 5% or 6%. So at 5%, you'd be spending, if you're borrowing a $300,000 loan, you're going to pay every month $1,610. That's why it's important to, to be able to get that good interest rate. So that's one way to calculate this. Now the other way to calculate uh, the PMT in this case without having to do all this work sheet here, which is actually, I strongly recommend that you utilize it this way, but it would be by using the formula this way. We go under insert and then we choose here the PMT function and then it says rate. We want to get the rate but the rate has to be calculated per, per month. We click here on the rate. The interest rate is 5%. And then we need to divide that by 12 for each month. The NPER would be the number of payments. So if you know that you're getting this loan for 30 years, then you could do 30 times 12. So you're saying there are going to be total number of payments for the loan. It's uh, 30 times 12, 360. Then the PV would be the present value, the amount of your loan. And then you hit OK here and we get the same value. So this is a little bit more work to set it up initially, but it's more useful in the long run. This is quicker to get it going, but you're embedding specific numbers and values within the cells. Interest payment for a particular period, that means that uh, we want to know how much interest are we going to pay on that first payment. Our payment was $1,600 per month. Now we want to calculate the interest that we are paying for that first month. So we go here under and we find here IPMT and then click OK. And then we want to figure out what the rate is. So the rate, fortunately, we're going to use this worksheet that I have prepared, or you can do the calculations like I showed you earlier. So we have C15, that's your rate. 
the PER, it wants to know the period in which you want to find out your interest rate, what you're paying for interest on that period. So in this case, we said we want to find the first payment that we make. How much are we paying on interest? So we put just number one, first payment. The NPER here, it would be the number of total payments. And then the PV, it's actually the value that you're borrowing. Then we go here and click OK. And now notice that on the first payment, if you're borrowing $300,000 at 5% for 30 years, on the first payment, you're going to pay $1,250 in interest. If you're going to change this to the second payment, notice it's probably going to be a little bit less, $1,248 for the second payment. Of course, that interest is going to drop from payment to payment to payment. So on the, let's say on the 359th period, you'd be paying only $13 in interest. That's why it's important to have as much money up front to pay for a house or something if you can, because you're avoiding a $1,200 interest payment of the first one. So now let's calculate how much your principal payment is going to be for this loan. And specifically in this case for month number one, of course, we could do it by deducting 1600 by doing the subtraction from here, but we're going to do it using the function here in Excel. So the way we do that is by going here under the insert function, and then we want to find a PPMT. Click on OK. And then again, we're going to use the same thing. So it's going to be rate, PR, the period. So the rate, the period, the number of payments, and the present value. So we have the rate, the period, the first time or the first payment that we are making to the loan company, then the number of total payments, then the present value. And then when we have filled out all of these values, we click OK here. And notice it comes to $360 that we are paying monthly toward our principal, toward our $300,000. So in the first month, we are paying $1,600 in total, but only $360 is applying toward the $300,000. So that's in brief how you can utilize some of the financial functions in Excel 2016. It's the same way that you can do it in the previous versions as well.